So I want us to get into the word of God uh, and continue with what I started two weeks back. And I'll pick it uh, from here as we go on and share together in God's word. So I began uh, two weeks back before, because last week I wasn't there, I began to share about something I haven't shared in the course of this year. And that is uh, about our, I mean, the, the, the teaching on giving in a broad sense. And I called it, uh, we are talking about the spirit of generosity. And so uh, one of the things I realize as a minister, even as we begin to learn this, that I have a responsibility as, as your pastor to teach you the whole counsel of scriptures. That means that there is no subject out of bounds. Uh, I need to teach and tackle the easy, the popular, the difficult, every aspect of the counsel of God uh, to the body of Christ. I have a responsibility as a pastor. Paul speaks to the church or to the elders in Acts chapter 20, and he says them that, you know, he has not ceased day and night to teach them the whole counsel of God. And one of the dangers of believers or preachers or pastors is to only teach our pet subjects or to only teach what people want to hear, which is the popular thing, and uh, avoid teaching subjects that may appear controversial or difficult uh, to teach. Uh, and as a good minister, we've got to teach all these things. And so one of those difficult and controversial subjects that uh, any sober, genuine minister would struggle with today because of the too much noise around it is the subject of giving. Uh, that's a subject that any sober minister uh, would find it uh, something that you don't want to go into because you don't want to be misunderstood. You don't want to be misquoted. Uh, you don't want to be associated uh, with some of the wrong things that are going on. But even when there is a lot of deception, misconceptions, and all the wrong things going on, it is actually the right time to be able to become the voice of reason and balance in that season and in that period. And so we've got to teach and talk about these things. Amen? And so uh, with that said, I began to talk about giving uh, two weeks back, and I said some things, and then I'll pick it up from where I left and continue on for the next 38 minutes according to the clock I've been given. Uh, now, we said... If you are going to stop, I mean, if you are not going to struggle with giving, if you are going to uh, understand giving well, or if you are going to practice giving as it ought to be practiced, uh, work with a spirit of generosity, you've got to have these two perspectives uh, you know, in place as a prerequisite. One, that God is the owner of all things. So the principle of ownership. Who owns uh, all things? You've got to understand God is the owner. And I labored to explain to us that. I labored to tell you the way the Bible says, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from above. John chapter 3 and verse 27. First Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. The Bible says, have you received anything? Uh, you know, uh, why do you boast? Uh, about what you have received in first guys i'm in first corinthians chapter uh, 4 and verse 7 in the new king james translation and so it says don't boast about what you have because you have received uh, whatever it is that you have james chapter 1 and verse 17 it says every good and perfect gift comes from above from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning uh, you know, the Bible also tells us, I think in Micah, Micah, whatever, chapter 5 and verse 8, I think it says, silver and gold belong to him. Praise the Lord. Silver and gold belong uh, to him. Is it Micah 8? I mean, 5, 8 or 8, 5 or whatever. Uh, just find it. Uh, silver and gold belong, it's Haggai actually, 2, 8. 
silver and gold belong uh, to the Lord. Psalms 50, uh, you will get the verse, I think 11 onward, uh, talks about a kettle in a thousand hills uh, are the Lord's. He owns a kettle in a thousand hills. Basically, I'm just walking you through what we walked with, through, which tells us and reminds us who owns everything. God is the owner of everything. Number two principle, we said then if God is the owner, I can never be an owner. I am only a steward. So you and I are stewards. What we have, we have been entrusted with. What we have, we have been given by the Lord. So we are a steward means one who manages something on behalf of another. So as a steward, you are a manager. You are managing God's resource that he has entrusted you with. Uh, and as a steward, you manage it the way God wants you to manage it. You use that which he has given you the way he wants you to use it. And so therefore, you manage it for the glory of God. Praise the Lord. For the good of his kingdom and for the glory of his name. And so, for example, when I take care of my family, it is for the glory of God. It glorifies God as a responsible husband and father to take care of my family. That brings glory to God. It never brings shame to God. Are you together with me? And so, when I take care of my family, the Bible says, he that cannot provide for his own family is worse than an unbeliever. Are an infidel. That means God expects me to take care of his family. So if God provides for me and then I go ahead and neglect my family, that's a shame and irresponsible according to scripture. But then it's not just for the glory of his name, but it's also for the good of his kingdom. And so God has given me power to make wealth so that I can establish his covenant. And so that's why God provides to me. And so stewardship, I don't want to go too much back into it, but I'm saying it because I am aware people tend to forget. And so we've got to reinforce these principles by repeating them. And so the principle of stewardship. And so uh, the other thing that will help you to be on the safe side when it comes to matters, money and uh, wealth, is who determines the content of your life what the bible calls contentment and so we are stewards and the other attitude we need to be, have as stewards is to be content with what god has given to us and has released to us every at every stage and season of our lives we need to become content and so contentment is key so that you don't fall prey to uh, the strategy of the enemy. One of the things that happens, uh, okay, maybe let me, that, that's something I've already, let me come back uh, when we talk about contentment. So who determines the content? Because God is the owner and God is the source of all good things, then I uh, trust that God has entrusted me and given me with what I have per season or per every stage of my growth and development. And by the way, that's how God gives it. God gives you as you mature in the faith, just like in the natural, you will not give a child uh, who is young the car keys to drive because they are not ready to drive. Are we together? So there is a level of maturity and growth that God will allow you to access certain things because they will not destroy you because you have grown to that level. But then, the one attitude you need to have as a believer, that it needs to be in you, even as you handle the resources God gives you, is the spirit of contentment. You've got to be content with what God gives you. Why did we say that? Because uh, one of the greatest challenges of mankind is uh, comparison. Comparison. We tend to compare ourselves with others to measure our progress. So if I want to see I am doing well, I look around me at my other friends, the guys I went to college with, the guys I went to school with, the guys uh, in my neighborhood. You know, when I look around and I see the cars parked in my neighborhood and mine is the smallest, then I feel I am not doing well compared to my 
neighbors. So what happens? I begin to covet what my neighbors have. And that leads me to competition. And competition will cause me to compromise. And compromise will affect and destroy my growth in character. My character is affected. So instead of growing into Christ-likeness, because I have in a competitive world and I become com I get into competition and I compromise, I take shortcuts because I want to get ahead. And so my character is affected and then that ends up affecting my destiny. And so it's important for you to understand that the key to avoid that slide, that decline, that nose dive into destruction, the key to avoid that is a spirit of contentment. Are we together? Up to that point, a spirit of contentment. So then we went to talk about how we should give. Second Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verse 7, uh, begins to talk to us about how we should give. Verse 6 says uh, about, uh, in verse 6 it says, if you... Uh, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So that speaks about generosity. Uh, is if you are giving, give. Don't be stingy even in your giving. You know, give. But then it goes on to talk about the attitude with which you give. The why, the how. And this is the how. It says uh, you have to give according to what you have purposed in your heart. So giving is not impulsive. Giving is not emotional. Giving is a decision that you make in your heart and you determine to follow. So it's a decision. We don't give emotionally. You don't wait to be whipped emotionally so that you can give. You don't give impulsively. You know, when you are excited, you give. When you are not, you don't. You found me in a good mood, so I'll give. That's not how we give. We give purposefully. We have purposed. We have made a decision. We have planned to do it. That's how we give. That means there is thought in our giving. We are not giving aimlessly, carelessly. We are thinking about it. That's how God has taught us. You don't need a sermon to give so that you can give. That is a wrong model. You need to purpose to give so that you can give. You know, when you entertain a situation where you have to be preached to, to give so that you give, then you enter into a place of deception and manipulation because you can easily fall prey into manipulation. And that's where the teaching that is famously known as prosperity gospel has landed many people. Because that kind of giving, therefore, is selfish giving. The preacher who entices you to give uh, so that you give with a promise or with the promises in the scriptures and we overstretch some of those principles and the believer who responds to that giving by giving because of what the preacher has told them both of you are in manipulation i wanted to use a different word but i the holy spirit checked both of you have fallen i mean are, are in deception praise the lord both of you, according to the words of Jesus, you have made my house a den of thieves. That's what Jesus says. So he chased who? He chased the guys who are giving, I mean, the guys who are collecting it and the guys who are giving it. Both of them are wrong. So when you accuse the guys who took money from you uh, in a manipulative way, you should also accuse yourself for giving that money because you are both culprits. Jesus chased both of you out. Yeah. So, um, where was I when I was saying that? I lost the trajectory of my thoughts. So, giving must be purposeful. Are we together? So, giving must be purposeful. Uh, come purpose to give. And part of that purpose is where, as a believer, I need to hear the Holy Spirit. I need to hear his instruction. And God can impress on me. And God can lead me. And God can speak to you through giving you a burden. God can speak to you through his word. God can speak to you through, as you think about it, he gives you a decision, give this amount. Or you can just 
respond in obedience because you love God, you love his word, and so you give. That's purposeful. Number two, of course, he says not grudgingly, not of necessity. Number two, God loves a cheerful giver. It must be a joy to give. Even when you are sacrificing, you must do it with joy. You don't do it complaining. You don't do it complaining. Have you ever gone to somebody's house and they have placed food before you to eat? But then as you are eating, they are complaining how economy has become difficult, how unga is so expensive, and you are eating. You know you will lose appetite. <laughs> they have given you food, but they are busy complaining how, even this morning, I didn't know what to buy. Do I buy sugar? Do I buy unga? So, utakula yo chakula. You will struggle eating that food because, man, this guy has too many problems. Even this food, I need to leave it. <laughs> you know, that's what happens when you eat in a house of a stingy person. You know, you can tell a generous person when you visit their house. Let me digress for a moment. You can tell a generous person when you visit their house because, you know, have you ever visited somebody and they tell you they are making tea? But one hour down the line, tea has not come to the table. <laughs> you know it takes 10, 15 minutes to do tea, but it has taken? Now, you, you are dealing with somebody struggling with generosity. Because, by the way, uh, it's not about what you have or you don't have. Sasao, kama hauna maziwa leta hiyo majani chai. In fact, uh, as you grow older, you will discover milk is not good for you. <laughs> you will discover, uh, let me tell you what another doctor told me. He told me, have you, ever, you know, milk is for cows. They are the ones which drink milk. Have you ever seen any other animal? Uh, you know, so I was like, hey, what do you mean? Milk is for cows. I drank milk when I was a child. Uh, so, so, nili muambia, mimi, wacha nana, mimi, ni kunyo maziwa yangu. I will not leave my, yeah, but I'm just telling you, as you grow older, sometimes the doctor can tell you not to have milk. My point is that what you have, you give. Amen. That's a spirit of generosity. Amen. It's African to do that. Uh, sometimes don't copy everything from the West. In the West, usiposema unakuja. Woe unto you when you visit. Because we will eat as you watch. Uh, you go into the world, you will see things. <laughs> so learn to be generous. Okay, now let me get back to my message. So the how. As I continue with that, Jesus, in the New Testament, stood at the treasury to see how people were giving. And he was there looking at not what they are giving, but how they were. And that told me something, that Jesus was looking for their attitude. And that matters more than what you are giving. What you are giving is going to be affected by the attitude with which you give. Basically, it means that if I have the right attitude, then I will give properly. I will not give change with the right attitude because my attitude means I value God, I value his work, and so I will not give what I don't need. Are you getting it? Yeah. So your attitude matters. And I will not give because my predominant reason for giving is receiving. That is the wrong thing about the prosperity gospel. We are giving on the basis of what we are receiving. And that's business. That is not generosity. We give, and I, re I, I retaliate, and I insist. We give because we love God. We give because we believe in his work. We give because we want to obey God. 
Those are the motivations of giving. Receiving is a consequence of giving, not the motivation for giving. God rewards obedience. God rewards our faithfulness. And so when I am obedient, it is given. God will reward my faithfulness and my obedience to him. I shouldn't worry about God rewarding me. Amen. So I can't do butter trade with God. You know, I can't trade with God as though we have no, it's transactional. My relationship with God is not transactional. It is covenantal. So my relationship is with a shopkeeper is transactional. The only thing that between, is between me and the shopkeeper is the money we exchange and the product they give. And the, some, some of us approach God like that. Like it's transactional. God has something I need and I have something he needs. So I give him what he needs, then he gives me what I need. That's a transaction. But our relationship with God is covenantal. I am his child. And because I am his child, he takes care of me and my need. And so I am giving not because I am bribing God to give to me. You can never bribe God. I repeat, you can never bribe God. You can't. Because this is why I know God is sovereign. God doesn't do things because we have made him do them. God does them because he wants to do them. The Bible teaches me God does all things. How many? How many? According to the counsel of his own will. Does it bring my influence there? Does it bring what I do there? No. He does all things according to the counsel of his own will. So, when I obey him, I leave it to him. He, because he is faithful, he will reward my obedience the way he knows how. And there is no better rewarder than God. Praise the Lord. How do I know that? Hebrews 6.10 tells me, God is not unjust to forget my labor of love in that I minister and continue to minister. That scripture tells me God is not unjust. God is not unfair. Amen. And so God rewards me the way he knows how. The Bible tells me that no one, you know, God is no debtor to man. You know, when I give to the poor, God will reward me for my faithfulness and obedience to do that because God is just and God is fair. Praise the Lord. So God, God rewards, and I keep emphasizing, and I want you to be a student of the Bible and come and tell me what else uh, doesn't fall in these three things. God rewards obedience, God rewards faithfulness, and God rewards diligence. Those are the three things God rewards. Obedience, faithfulness, and diligence. So you want God to reward you? Align yourself in those three things. Be obedient, be faithful, and be diligent. And you will enjoy God's reward. Amen. You will enjoy God's reward. So you can never bribe God. Now, as we talk about giving, we cannot talk about giving without teaching people about the other aspect of giving, which is receiving. We can talk about giving without talking about receiving. One of the things, I mean, one of the things that causes the, the so-called prosperity gospel to become a problem is because it emphasizes giving uh, only and giving uh, upward only and it doesn't emphasize uh, or teach about uh, stewardship and management of what God has given and it doesn't teach production. So it creates a consumer-oriented church, a church that wants to consume. And so this is the mindset that it has brought into the church. Bless me, help me, give me. And so that's the mindset we come with even to the things of God. And so 
uh, it's about what God will do for me. And I never think about how God will use me to be a blessing to others. Praise the Lord. And so it's important for you to understand, God or Christ is not raising a consumer-oriented church. The last I checked in scripture, the church is the one advancing. It's not the one sitting back. The Bible says, you know, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. The last I checked from a physical perspective, because the Bible uses imagery, gates don't move. So if the gates shall not prevail, that means shall not resist the church. The church is the one advancing. So the church I see in the Bible is a church that is moving. It's a movement. It's not a religion. It's a movement. It's a church that is on the move. It's a church that is doing stuff. It's a powerful church. It's a victorious church. It's not a weak church. Praise the Lord. And so that's the mindset we need to have. You know, uh, and the problem is we have been reduced to a consumer-oriented church, so we come to receive. Help me tell your neighbor, I came to give. Yeah. As much as I am going to receive, my main drive is to give what God has put in me. My gifting, my talents, my abilities, my wisdom, I came to give. I came to release something. And when you come with that mindset, you position yourself to become a channel that God can use to be a blessing to others. Because I came to give. Amen. Now, let's talk about receiving for the next 17 minutes. Receiving. So, God has promised that give and it shall be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. God has promised that um, when I give, uh, I become a channel through which God can use. Because... Uh, you know, that is a principle. Now, I want you to understand this. I want you to understand. Giving is not just a biblical principle. It is a universal principle. It's a life principle. Giving is not just a biblical, meaning it's a biblical principle, but then it doesn't respect any person as you apply it as a principle. When Peter got a revelation about the fact that God doesn't discriminate between the Gentile and the Jew, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 34, when he got that revelation, he said, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that... Can you read that together with me? Two, three. In truth, I perceive that Repeat that again. God, I want you to say it until you believe it. God, let's go to the next verse. What does it say? Go, go on. But, God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever, are you among the whoever? Are you included in the whoever? Whoever fears him and does what? Works righteousness is accepted by? Now, I like the way it uses the word works righteousness. Because righteousness is the principle, God's way of doing and being. The principles of God. If you apply yourself to the principles of God, they will deliver the results they are expected to deliver. Are you hearing me? Now, there is another scripture. I don't remember where it is, but I'm so happy I have a media team that is word savvy. So they can give me the scripture. Nemo are set up. So they'll give me the scripture. There is this scripture uh, somewhere, I think it's in Psalms. And it says, The poor and the rich, God is the maker of them all. It's a very sobering scripture. I want you to read it. Uh, thank you, guys. God bless you. Is it the one? No, no, no. It's not the one. The poor and the rich. Yes. 
Psalms 22 and verse 2. The rich, sorry, Proverbs, sorry. The rich have what in common? Somebody has gotten what I wanted to say. The poor and the rich have what in common? God, the Lord is the maker of them. That is where their commonality ends. Some, some are still loading. That's where their commonality ends. That means the distinction between the rich and the poor is not something uh, out of this world. It is what you do. Because the rich and the poor, God is the maker of them. But the distinction comes with what you do with what God has entrusted you with as a steward. The parable of the talents. One was given one, another one was given two, another one was given five. Let me ask you a question. Was God unfair? Those who champion equality, if you gave Pastor Mbogua one, you must give Anthony the same. That's not in kingdom. God gave Albert, you are given maybe one. You know, Mwago here maybe was given two. Alfred here was given three. God gave the Bible says, according to their ability. God looks at, can you handle one? Then he gives you one. Can you handle two? He gives you two. But then when God comes to judge, God doesn't judge you with what you have produced. Now that you had five, you have brought ten, you are better than the one who had two and he brought five. Are you getting it? No. God doesn't reward you based on what you have produced. God rewards you based on how faithful you are with what he gave you. So that makes his judgment fair. Whether you had one, whether you had two, whether you had five, God's judgment is fair because God judges based on faithfulness. Remember what I said, God rewards faithfulness, obedience, and diligence. So God judged based on what they did with what they were given. Tumelewana. Now, what did they do with what they were given? They produced. The, the thing about stewardship, and it's important that you understand this, when God put man in the garden, he told them, got the man, man one instruction. Cultivate the land. Till the ground. This is the principle, and this is the work of stewardship. You are being entrusted as a steward of God's, what God owns, and this is God's requirement of stewardship. Make what I have given you better than you found it. Can we do that? God has entrusted you with stewardship, and requires you to do what? Make it better than you found it. If you are married, and you are given a spouse on the day of the wedding, 10 years down the line, that lady should be better than your founder. That man should be better than you found him. God gave you children. Those children, by the time they are out of your house, should be better than when they came. They came knowing nothing. They came blank. But by the time they leave your house, they should be better than when God gave them to you. That is what is stewardship and faithfulness. So God gave you money. God will come and ask, what did you do with the money I gave you? So we are still, I'm laying the foundation for receiving. 
so that we don't teach you giving and we don't teach you, I mean, we don't, we don't just teach you giving, we need to teach you how to receive. Now, listen to me. This is how you receive. Money will never drop from heaven. Have you ever seen money drop from heaven? If you have, I want to come to where you live so that I can enjoy the drops from, because money doesn't drop from, money doesn't drop from heaven. Provision doesn't just drop from heaven. And even when it ever happened in the Bible, it was seasonal. It happened for a season, and God waited until they ended, entered into the land he gave them, and once they entered, this is where he told them, I'm taking you. This is the destination. This is the blessing. This is the place God was journeying with them to. Why he delivered them, to bring them here. When they got there, the miracle of manna ceased. And God says, go and work on the ground. Till that ground. And you will eat of your produce. When I see Listen to me. The legitimate way that God has given to provide for us is through work. Work or legitimate work is the way through which God has given, has provided so that we can, be, we can receive. It's the channel that God uses for us to receive. Work is the legitimate medium through which God channels what he gives back to us. Praise the Lord. Work. Now, I want you to understand, I did not say having a job is the legitimate channel. I said work. There is a difference. You can have a job and you are not a worker. There are many people who have jobs, but their employer currently is looking for ways to sack them because they are not delivering. They have a job, but they don't. So it's not a job. It's work. Work implies that you have a work ethic. You believe in putting your hands to work. That's what it means. You believe in putting your hands to work. Now, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28, God gives man a command. What does he say? Be fruitful. Multiply. Fill the earth. Subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God gave man work, an assignment. Go and be fruitful. Go and work. Go and, you know, uh, subdue the earth. Go and have dominion. Give them work. After he gave them work, verse 29, the Bible says, and God said, see, I have given you. So the giving came after the commissioning of work. See, I have given you. Work, help me tell your neighbor, work is not a curse. Work is the medium through which God releases resources to us. It's the means through which God releases resources to us. So, we cannot teach you to give, but then you give and you wait for some miraculous thing to happen uh, while you're doing nothing. No. When you give, then... Go out there and do what? Find something to do. And work. It's a principle. Even Jesus worked. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is still day. He worked. That's John 9, 4. He worked. And God has called us to do what? Why? Because work serves more than one purpose for God. Work builds your character. As you work, God develops you and builds character in you and brings you to a place of maturity. So that's why work is important. It's not just a means of provision. God uses work to build you up. Praise the Lord. 
So that's why we've got to put our hands to work. Laziness has no place in the kingdom. You've got to work. What are you doing with your life? Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10. 9, 10. Can you read that scripture with me? What does it say? So it says what? Whatever your hand finds, but I was trained or I studied this in college, and there are no jobs in that area of my study. What does the Bible say? If you don't get what you've trained for, what does the Bible tell you? Are we together? Put your hands to? That's a principle. Put your hands to work. If I ask the question today, how many today are doing what they studied for in college? Or put it this way, how many are not doing what they studied for in college? You studied, but that's not what you're doing today. You came out of college, you studied, but that's not what you're doing today. So can you imagine if you are waiting for that thing that is in the area of your study, where will you be? Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all diligence. Because while it is still day, which means while you are still alive and here, work. Because the night is coming when no one can work. That's what Jesus said. And that's the means through which God provides for us. The Bible speaks about God blessing the work of our hands. God blessing what? The work of your hands. What are you doing with your hands? God establishing the work of your hands. What are you doing with your hands? Yes, I have this dream that I want to become this or that. But meanwhile, before you get to the dream, what are you doing with your hands? Because that's the channel through which God comes. Now, listen. I want you to understand. God's, the channel of God, it, it doesn't say the salary you get is what uh, God, will, God has given and depended on to bless your life. God doesn't bless you, based, God doesn't bless you with a salary. No, you didn't get me. Because some of us think when I say work, the money you get at the end of the month is the only thing God uses to bless you. God doesn't bless you with a salary. In fact, if I ask another question, how many people the salary you get is what provides for everything you have at the end of the month? I'm sure many of us, your salary is not enough. How did you make it? Somehow God came through. But why did God do that? Because you are doing something with your hands. When you work with your hands, the little you do is amplified. On Wednesday, I told them a story, and I'll give you that story, uh, which is in the Bible. And this story is the story of the four lepers. You know the story of the four lepers? The four lepers, I want to describe them for a moment. They were outcasts. They were rejected. They were not included. They were outside the city where there is no provision. Everybody else is in the city, they are outside. So whatever was in the city, they didn't access. So they were outcast, they were ostracized, they had no network, social network, so to say. Everything was working against them. And to, make, to crown it all, they were lepers. That means they were sick. You get so they could have sat there and said, we have been rejected. No door has opened for us. Is that familiar? We've knocked doors. No door has opened for us. We have been rejected. Nothing is coming through our way. We have no favor. We have no opportunity. 
and here we are, we have all these problems. We are even sick and walk with a victim mentality and say, Pakatu Apatuku. Now they say this if we sit here, we die. If we go into the city, we die. If we go the opposite side to the camp of the Assyrians, we die. In other words, their situation was that bad. Wherever they went, death was imminent, facing them. Everything was looking around them bleak and bad. But you guess what? They did not say, so let us be victims and wait here we. They said what? What did they say? Okay, where is that scripture? My guys. Okay. What does it say here? If we say we will enter the city, the famine is there. We shall die there. If we sit here, we die also. Now, therefore, let us do what? Let us. If they keep us alive, we shall. If they kill us, we shall. In other words, we are not going to sit here and wait to die. Let's die doing something. That's the principle. Let's die doing if it's death that is coming, whichever way it will come, let it find us doing. And guess what happened? When they took that step, the Bible says, God amplified their feeble, weak steps. And the enemy out there had the sound of a mighty army. God will amplify the steps you take. When you take a step, However little, however feeble, however weak, when you take that step, God will amplify that step to become something that is going to be of help. These people who wanted to, I mean, who every turn they could have died, they are the, end, the people who ended up becoming the saviors of their people, their brethren. They saved them because they took a step. Was that step easy? No. But they took a step. And when they took that step, they became the saviors to their brethren. God is waiting for you to take a step. And as you take that step and trust God with whatever little you have, do something however little it may seem. When you take that step, God will amplify that step. Praise the Lord. God will do what? amplify that step. So, legitimate work. Go and find something to do. And as you do, God will reward. And those who have something to do, develop a work ethic in your life. Praise the Lord. As you work, do it as unto the Lord. Don't work for your boss. Work for the heavenly boss. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Work as unto the Lord. When you work looking at your boss, that's where you, have, you are going wrong. Work looking at the heavenly boss, the owner of all things. The one who has entrusted you as a steward in that place. When you work for him, you have a better reward than when you work for your employer. One as if you. In fact, it's, you need to understand that irrespective of your credentials, your employer cannot adequately remunerate you. Only God can reward you for your faithfulness and your work. So work as unto God. Be diligent in what you're, you're, you're doing. Give your best to what you do and God will reward you. Amen? God will God will reward you. That's how God comes to us. If the kingdom of God is going to have the resources it needs, we've got to fold our sleeves and get our hands to work and trust God to be channels that God can use to advance his course. Amen. Amen. So the millions will not just show up they'll show up because we are doing something. And we can talk about work and work, but let's begin with that understanding.
that work is the legitimate means through which God channels resources to us. Let's pour ourselves to work. And God will reward our diligence, our obedience, and our faithfulness. Amen?